So thanks everyone for coming. This is the first session in the seminar season this year. And we've got a really exciting talk and demo to kick things off. We've got Rick and James here who are postdoctoral research fellows working on the S3A project. And they're going to be talking about some of the latest stuff that they've done with maths content with BBC and also tell us a bit about how to Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks Laura. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back after the summer. Um, yeah, I'm Rick, this is James. Um, as Laura says, we both work on a project called S3A. One of you, uh, one or two of you may be aware of a little bit about what that's about. I'm going to describe to you a little bit of the work that we've been doing on that project. It's been going for quite a while now. Um, but specifically, we're going to be presenting to you about this. So we, we recently created a, a piece of content, a piece of immersive audio drama content called the Vostok K incident. Um, now, you'll get a little bit more about what that's about as, a, as we go on. But effectively, it's, it's using your personal devices, um, and such as phones, tablets, laptops, etc., to try and create some form of immersive audio experience in the room. So the idea is that um, we can do that to overcome barriers like having to set up complex speaker setups, etc. But we have an online version of this, which came out about um, just, uh, just under two weeks ago. So you can go home and listen to this yourself. You can connect all your personal devices at home and have a go. But uh, the way we're going to kind of run this session is we're firstly going to give you a bit of an introduction to the work that we've been doing that's kind of led to this. Uh, but more importantly, later on, it's going to be a reasonably informal session. We're going to hopefully get everyone's phones out and start having a play. So um, from our perspective, we want to try and break the record, which currently stands at 18 devices, I think. I, think that's, yeah, I don't think anyone's beat so Yeah, although BBC R&D, uh, who are very much involved with this, they're also doing a seminar right now and doing the exact same thing. So there's several things that might happen. One, we might break the record. Two, we might crash BBC Taster. Three, we might break our Wi-Fi. Who knows? But we're going to see what falls down first. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, in a nutshell, what we're going to be presenting. So yeah, just to start, what is S3A? So as I say, I myself and James have been researchers on S3A, uh, which is a large multi-institution project involving a number of partners, a number of universities, which are shown across the bottom there. So we have um, three universities involved, um, Salford here, where we have Myself, James, and uh, another research fellow called Yan, who's not here today, unfortunately, back in China. Um, but then we also have other institutions, um, Southampton, where I think we have three researchers, um, Surrey, where we have, I think, about four, and then there's numerous PhDs involved in this, um, and also various other academics, so people that you know here, Trevor Cox, for instance, leads S3A from a Salford perspective. Um, and this is all funded by EPSRC, so Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. It's four year, uh, sorry, five year project. Um, we've had four years, so we're now pretty much into our last year and starting to look at our kind of outputs from S3A, uh, of which this um, BBC Taster version uh, implementation is one of those. Um, overall, the kind of focus of S3A is on, uh, as the tagline suggests, uh, enabling immersive listener experiences, and specifically in the home and in kind of practical environments. So kind of taking them out of the lab, uh, taking immersive listener experiences into the home. Um, that's specifically with the aim of doing this through the concept of use of uh, a thing called object-based audio. Now, is anyone familiar with object-based audio as a term? Just by a show of hands. <laughs> a few, maybe half the room, yeah? OK, so it's pretty simple. I mean, if anyone's used to working in some form of digital audio workstation, making some ho uh, music at home or anything like that, you'll kind of get the, the idea. But traditionally, kind of, we have channel-based audio is some form of way of packaging up a bunch of sounds. So we might render it down to stereo or 5.1 and then send that to the, the listener's home. But instead of doing that, what we're doing is saying, well, that, that's quite restrictive because once you get to the listener's home with that pre-rendered mix, that, that's what you've got. You can't really unpick it and do much with that then. We can free up a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we can do with that, however, if we switch to this kind of 
object-based world where instead of sending this pre-rendered content packaged into stereo or whatever it may be, we send all the kind of individual sounds so we can have think of these conceptually as things like dialogue and background spot effects, etc. And also a set of instructions on how to piece these back together. And we call that metadata. So that's just to give you a kind of background of S3A is very much about using object-based audio in order to try and create these improved listener experiences. A number of things that we've done recently, um, we finished uh, our fourth year with a, uh, a co-organized event at BBC Broadcasting House, um, where S3A were, on, uh, were part of a tech fair and some uh, demonstrations that got shown to quite a large number of people. Um, including some of the technology that we've been developing on S3A. So in terms of uh, rendering, we have this kind of high-end sound bar, uh, but then also we were demonstrating our um, device orchestrations to our mobile phone, the thing that we're going to be demonstrating to you today. Um, they're kind of two extremes, but they're, they're enablers for people experiencing immersive content in their own homes. Um, other things that we can do with, uh, sorry, I should that we've also been focusing quite a lot on tools. So we created a lot of tools which enable an object-based workflow. So at the moment, we've got very much um, our stereo workflow or our five-point workflow in, in terms of creating content. But we needed to look at how we create an object-based workflow. So we've focused quite a lot last year or so on creating tools. And also, uh, based on the output of some of the, the work that um, James does and Jan does, um, been looking at creating these things that we call perceptual meters. Um, so I won't go into much detail on that, but just to say, for example, an intelligib intelligibility meter rather is um, one example of that. A lot of work in the background in terms of what's effectively pumping out a single number at the end. But this allows us to be able to potentially um, ad adapt our object-based mix at the user end in, in an optimal way, depending on um, their environment and their setup and, and who they are. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of output from S3A over the last four years, um, but we want to look at uh, one particular use case at the moment. And this was largely driven by um, the fact that we know when we're in these kind of rooms, so most of you have probably seen this room. Um, this is our listening room at Salford. We have in this WFS rig, for example, we have 112 loudspeakers, and we know with a bit of work we can create pretty amazing immersive listener experiences within those setups. But if we want to take that to the home, then we have a whole bunch, or even on the move, or wherever that may be, um, we have a whole bunch of uh, things that get in the way of producing amazing experiences. Not least the fact that we don't have many loudspeakers in the space, potentially, but also they might be in the wrong place. Um, they might not be a part of a calibrated system, etc. So those are kind of barriers that get in the way of people um, engaging and listening to immersive spatial audio experiences. So with that in mind, we moved on to start looking at this, which is an idea that came up uh, in S3A a couple of years ago, but James will talk a bit more through the timeline of how that happened in a second. Um, but the basic concept behind this is we know that many systems such as 5.1, etc., are not realistic for the vast majority of people to install in their homes. There are some, and even those that do get installed are potentially installed incorrectly. But what we do know is that people will have things like this lying around at home. So we have phones, tablets, laptops, Bluetooth speakers, DAB radios, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just littered around your room that could theoretically be addressable and made part of some form of audio uh, experience that you listen to in your home. So that was um, what we started to look at, and is what we uh, and is what we've coined uh, media device orchestration, or MDO. So you might hear us say MDO a couple of times during the presentation. Um, not particularly a kind of uh, snazzy public-facing uh, acronym at the moment, but uh, that's what we refer to it as, and we've been referring to it in our publications. But to to kind of sum it up, it's this concept of using ad hoc arrays of devices to augment media experience. So ad hoc in the fact that they're just kind of a bit randomly spread out or we don't know quite where they're going to be before we create the content. Uh, and also this concept of augmenting a media experience because we've 
uh, that media experience need not be uh, only audio, by the way, that's what we've been looking at, but augmenting normally because we're, we're tending to uh, add this onto a traditional kind of stereo reproduction. Um, so yeah, this is what we call MDO. Um, and we've been looking at uh, some of the development that over the last couple of years, which James is going to uh, talk to you about now. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so um, yeah, so we started looking at this um, idea of uh, device orchestration in a um, hack week that we ran at the, at the BBC back in early 2016. So we basically got together some of the, um, the researchers on the project, along with some uh, sound designers and content producers to kind of look at what we could do with um, object-based audio if we were able to send kind of individual sounds to, to individual devices in the room. Um, now this, this idea kind of came about with this um, concept that we were calling playing the room. So we had some kind of com computer vision people working on the project who could um, kind of detect features in the room so they could detect where doors were, where windows were. So we thought, okay, well, if we know where the window is, we know where the speakers are in the room and we have all of the sounds in objects, wouldn't it be fun if we could route like a door knock to the speaker that was closest to the door, for example? Um, which was quite good fun, but we realized that was that was quite gimmicky. Um, but what we did realize from, from this week was that you, we could actually create pretty good um, immersive spatial audio experiences just using these small kind of consumer grade devices. So we had like Bluetooth speakers, phones, um, I think, do we have an Amazon Alexa, I think, or some... I think we had a very early version before it. Yeah, here. something um, like that. Kathy had one that she brought up mm. in the States. Yeah. yeah, we basically, we had all of these devices dotted around the room, and the, the sound designer we were working with, Kathy, Kathy Robinson, made some cool um, examples of how we could use that using some kind of comedy programs and, and radio drama that she'd, uh, she'd worked on. So, so yeah, this, this was kind of enough to, to convince us that the idea was worth uh, pursuing. So we spent the next kind of 12 months or so of S3A kind of, kind of formalizing this idea into a, um, into a system, which was called the Challenge Force system within the project. But that was basically trying to automate the process a bit more. So if we had an, an object-based scene, we've got our audio objects with some metadata describing like the position um, of the object, what the object is, then how can we kind of automate the process of routing those um, those sounds to these additional devices we, we have in the group? Um, and then, yeah, following that, we we decided that um, we wanted to look at kind of what, what we could do um, with this idea more, more formally. So we so prior to this, we were using kind of content that we that we already had. We wanted to know what um, kind of creatives and, and producers and sound designers think they might be able to decide here. So we, we held a workshop again at the BBC. We got together a bunch of kind of writers, sound designers, musicians and composers, demonstrated them um, this idea in the, the BBC's labs and basically said, can you come up with some kind of use cases that you think would be, um, would be a good use of this technology? Um, this led us to um, commissioning a piece of a uh, radio drama, which is the, the Bostock Hay incident that we're going to play you today, um, where we kind of asked a, a script writer to, to kind of write a script um, incorporating you know, what they thought they could do to enhance their storytelling if they could send kind of additional sounds to these devices in the room. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail in, in a second, but. Um, but yeah, essentially, we went through the process of commissioning a commissioning a, commissioning a script. So we worked with a worked with a writer um, and, a, and a sound designer on the piece. Um, kind of running alongside this, um, we had our colleagues at Southampton develop some BST plugins and tools that we could use to actually produce content and start to come up with a come up with a workflow for this this kind of way of working. Um, we also ran here at Salford some perceptual evaluation, so I'm not going to talk about this um, in detail, but if you're interested, there's, we've had a recent paper at the uh, AES conference in spatial audio. We basically asked people to rate an um, uh, MDO system with some additional Bluetooth speakers <laughs> against some more traditional home audio systems, so like stereo and surround. And we found that, that, that kind of our approach was able to perform and similarly to a to a well calibrated 5.1 system. So even using low quality speakers, we could we could provide a, a, a good kind of immersive experience. 
And then, yeah, finally, what we're going to demonstrate today, we've just released this, uh, this content on BBC Taster, so you should be able to kind of connect in your, your phones. Hopefully, we can get lots of people's devices connected in the room and kind of have a demonstration of what this, uh, what this sounds like. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully the end listener is uh, is happy. <laughs> so that's what we're aiming for. Um, so yeah, the, kind of the whole development cycle of what we've been doing over the past twelve months or so is kind of has kind of um, been based around this cycle of the production of new content. Um, that content can be used to kind of evaluate the system. And that evaluation can kind of feed into um, the development of tools, and the, yeah, the tools can be used for production. So, kind of, we're going to kind of touch on on each of these areas, and then, yeah, going to give you a demonstration of the some of the technology and the final content. Um, so, yeah, like I say, we we commissioned a piece of content specifically to explore this idea of um, of device orchestration. So we worked with a production company called um, called Naked Productions. Um, so this was the lead sound designer, who was in charge of kind of all of the recording of the piece and the, and the mixing, um, along with Tony Chernside, who was actually an, an MS, oh no, a PhD student here. He did his masters here as well, didn't he? I think Tony. Um, so yeah, he's at the he's works part partly at the BBC and partly at, um, at Naked Productions. Um, so we've worked with with Eloise in the past on the on the S3A project, producing um, some kind of immersive 3D content. So she was a really good person to work with. She understood the kind of research workflow and that things maybe don't always work. Um, yeah, she's got some got some really good ideas. Um, and kind of working together with them in the project as a whole, we we came up with a commissioning brief for what we um, for what we wanted this drama to to achieve. Um, and we sent that over to um, our writer Ed Selleck. So he was um, he was invited to come to the university. We kind of demonstrated the the system to him to give him an idea of what we were um, of what we were aiming for. And he was asked to essentially incorporate this idea of using um, kind of additional devices in his in his storytelling. So he was kind of asked to to um, kind of incorporate that into um, into a script. And the outcome was um, this thing called the Bostock K incident, which we're going to um, play you today. Um, and it's this kind of sci-fi piece based around this um, RAF pilot who gets caught up in this Russian time loop experiment. So there's some kind of time travel stuff going on, and yeah, it's all very very confusing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it works really well with this idea of you know being able to have um, you know some sounds jumping out of the, the stereo into additional devices and a kind of flexible system. Um, yeah, we recorded the piece at um, the Low Four Studios, the old Renata Studios in Manchester. So this was the um, this was the cast. So yeah, we worked with um, worked with professional actors. Um, this was the studio. It's amazing. It was like going back into the into the 70s. Carpet. It's incredible. Um, and yeah, it was it was all recorded pretty much like you would expect a radio drama to be recorded. Actually. Um, other than we built this, um, we built this booth to try to recreate the acoustic of a cockpit. So the um, so the main character recorded all of his dialogue in here to try to capture some of the acoustic. There's kind of a vocal booth over here where the the other actors were um, just on stereo mics. And the only thing we really aimed to do was to kind of keep the um, keep the dialogue as separated as possible. So we had kind of individual objects to to work with in 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 the mix. Um, but yeah, other than the other than the dialogue, pretty much everything else was done through um, through sound design by by Eloise. Um, yeah, so just some more pictures of the studios. This was a kind of read through with the cast, um, and that's our kind of main main character in his um, in his kind of cockpit booth. Um, okay, so once we'd recorded all of the all of the material, the the mix was done in quite a, well a very untraditional way because you know nobody's ever mixed a piece of content like this before, so we had to figure out kind of what we were doing as we were going along. Um, but one thing we were really keen on was not to have the the thing mixed in a studio with kind of precisely positioned loudspeakers. So we we actually did the mix in the BBC's usability lab, so that's uh, kind of where they do usability testing of things like iPlayer. 
and it's kind of a, a lab that's that's kind of decked out like a living room essentially. So we had our um, our sign designers in the kind of sat in the middle of this living room, and then we had I think it was eight or nine of these little Bluetooth speakers kind of dotted around the the room that were kind of set up as kind of proxies for mobile phones, tablets, and, and laptops. Um, and Rick's going to show in a, in a minute the kind of production tools that we that we developed to allow. Um, Eloise and Tony to kind of dynamically route sounds to these to these different devices in the room. Um, but yeah, the, the general setup was that um, yeah, Eloise is working in um, working in Pro Tools. We had our production tools that Rick's going to show in a in a second kind of host repo. And then we had yeah, main stereo pair of speakers like the gen that we got in front of the room, and then a number of these Bluetooth devices kind of dotted around. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to, to Rick again. He's going to talk a bit about the production tools. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably should just mention just uh, before I go on. Also, as well, there was a there was a kind of bolt on on the end of this, which I won't. Um, it isn't actually on the slides. Which is a little bit of mobile phone simulation basically going on. So we patch in the background that could. We could play around with having randomized delays across devices and also filters that made them sound like mobile phones. So that was our kind of way of auditioning and making sure that these sounded more like what the user would inevitably end up listening to in, in the vinyl version. But in terms of the tools that they used, um, the kind of more professional tools that they used, this was, that bit was more of a bit of a bolt on to the end. Um, we had uh, an entirely kind of S3A tools workflow process, apart from obviously um, various VSTs and things that Eloise was using for sound design. Um, and we did this, as James mentioned, in the usability lab with two different uh, computers. So the, the computer on the left was uh, Pro Tools, where Eloise was working in a kind of familiar environment. And the computer on the right was pretty much where all of our software lived. This could have all happened on the same machine, but uh, it was just a kind of familiarity thing for, for Eloise, the reason why we did it in that way. To kind of, in very kind of loose terms, go over what tools we had, um, not at all in detail, but just to kind of give you a, a, an overall idea. We had um, the renderer, which is our S3A renderer, which has been developing um, over the last uh, three, four years. Um, and that's kind of running in the background uh, and accepting audio. So in this case, uh, this was accepting some audio from um, a DAW. So in this DAW, effectively tracks are objects. So each of the tracks is a separate object. Um, and that's kind of how you intuitively think about things when you're making a mix anyway, really. It's just that we don't pre uh, then package it up into something like stereo for distribution. Um, in terms of the uh, what we did then to tell the renderer what to do with this audio, we then needed this um, metadata stream, which we referred to, I think, a number of times. Uh, previous. And this metadata came in in two formats. So firstly, came across in a kind of quite conventional way. So we have these um, S3A panners, which are a kind of three-dimensional panner. And you can also adjust things like level and things like that as well. But these uh, are defined, these sit on each of the individual tracks and define what we're calling our um, core metadata. So core in the sense that it's quite objective and um, the, the normal values that you would think of that you would apply, level and position, et cetera. Um, but also core in the way that uh, it's metadata that the renderer is able to understand. So the, the renderer, because it's hard coded, is only able to understand a, a subset of this kind of metadata to make its uh, rendering decisions based on. In addition to that, we had a little bit more of a complex case. So being able to say we've got a device over there, somewhere over there, and, and how do we want to create room for the sound designer to say when a certain combination of objects should play in various different places. There was all sorts of um, factors, that, uh, complicated factors and rules that we needed to come up with. And we use this tool um, that has existed in S3A for a couple of years now uh, called the Metadapter. So snazzy title. Metadata adapter. Metadata. Um, now, this is a, a little bit of a complex diagram. Well, it's not overly complex, but the the important part to note here is that we have this metadata where you can it, you can basically write in a bunch of processes, and that's all done in Python. So it's done in a Python framework which has been created um, 
by Andreas, who Andreas Frank at Southampton, who works on the project, uh, in such a way that we can kind of write these processes as slightly more uh, acoustic engineers or audio engineers rather than um, C++ coders. So this allowed us to be able to rapidly code in some rule sets that um, that we needed at the time, because inevitably when we were in the production, we didn't want to pre-bias the, the producer and the sound designer by saying, these are the rules that we've implemented, these are the tools that you can use. We wanted to say, this is a brand new way of, of playing audio across these devices. What would you like to do with them? And then they say, well, I'd actually quite like it if when this does that, this object should go over there. And we're like, OK, right, I'll code that. Just give me half an hour. And this allowed us to be able to do that in that way. And another tool that allowed us to do that was this thing, which, again, is a little bit of an engineer's tool. But this also sat as a VST inside the DAW. So um, it's, in essence, a bit of a spreadsheet going on. But what we could do is define a kind of config in the background that determined which of these bits of metadata existed. And then we could add objects and then create metadata per object. And then we could send it on to the renderer um, or to the metadata, rather. Um, and in doing this, we could create kind of more advanced metadata, as we generally refer to it. Um, and it could be arbitrary, and we could make it up as we went along, as and when needed, and as we learned exactly what it was that we needed to do, uh, needed to create in order to make a, a, a system where it adapted to the number of devices and where, where they were put. Um, so yeah, this was in tandem with the uh, kind of core metadata. So the, the core and the advanced metadata both go into the metadata. That kind of does all our crunching that we um, do in our rules in Python and then spits it out as core, meta, uh, core metadata to the renderer so that it understands what's going on. Um, and then we can also kind of have a flashy renderer inside a, a, a DAW as well. So we can do all this inside Reaper, for example. OK, um, so that was the, sorry, I should say at this point, well, how are we doing for time? We're on about half past. So uh, we're just going to very briefly just show you a little bit of the um, tools that are running in the background of this, um, just to give you a sense of what's happening. Now, um, as James mentioned before, uh, in the setup, we had something that looked very much like this, but with uh, these kind of Bluetooth speakers dotted around the space and wired so that we could audition what was happening. Um, we have this kind of tab on the left that James is showing at the moment. It shows all of our objects um, and all the metadata that we've assigned to those objects. Um, but also we have a, a loudspeaker tab across the top. There's also a group one, but I won't go into that. But the loudspeaker one also allowed us to assign some metadata to loudspeakers, effectively saying we've got a loudspeaker over there, we've got a loudspeaker over there. And we use these quite crude zonal systems. So we had this, you um, might be able to see on this drop down bit here. So we've got like near front, near side, near rear. And those were the kind of zones that we, the kind of zones that we used in order to define where a, a speaker was. So we didn't want to go for a real exact pinpoint positioning of devices, because that's not how it was going to end up being in, in a kind of realistic rolled out version of this. So we wanted to kind of come up with this zonal system. Um, and so we'll just play you a small amount of content now. Um, yeah, we'll need to switch these back on. We'll first start it off in stereo so that you can hear when there's no speakers switched on. So at the moment, we've got, um, where are we at the moment? We've got loud speakers, yes. So we've got this, um, this switch at the moment. All these are turned off, so we've got no devices turned off. Uh -huh. So if we start playing just a small section, well, hopefully it, here we just come out. Are you there? Hello, Job. I'm here. Are you eating? What is it? Where'd you get it? Okay. So it we've got our um, main character and our supporting character are both in the stereo, so everything's stereo at the moment because all of these devices are turned off. If we were to switch on um, one of the devices. Shekels, so. are you there? Hello, Joe. 
And then equally, we can turn on the second device, so we can turn on the one that's on our near side. Eggs, hardly state secrets. Well, you told me not to say. Jamie's spoiled. Never mind all that. What's out there? Uh, clouds, Sam. Clouds and sea. So we get some additional content that's going into both of these devices. The, the reasons why are complex, and I won't go into, into detail, but we can see a number of really important kind of uh, parameters that we've set where this kind of this MDO threshold so that's reasonably intuitive to understand we need this number of devices connected in order for an object to be able to go into a device before that we won't allow it to so in the case of our um, supporting character which is this it's not been changed from more important than um, <laughs> that uh, it was set to one which meant that the, the moment we connect one device it's allowed to go into one of these devices uh, the the general and general Tat, but general and Tatiana, um, they're two characters which appear uh, or are allowed to appear at least when two devices were connected, which is why they weren't playing when um, there was one device connected, but they were then allowed to go into a device when two were there. There's a lot more to it than that, in that um, there's also this MDO only flag for general and Tat, which means that they were never there in the first place. So they will never play unless there's the required MDO devices for them to go in. Otherwise, they remain hidden. And what this allowed us to do was kind of explore this um, kind of, well, in this particular circumstance, a kind of shifted perspective on the narrative. You could do this, well, and we did do this with sound design as well, but it allowed us to play around with sounds that are not always part of the piece. It's, uh, it starts getting very complicated when we go over to the uh, right-hand side where um, we can see a bunch of other parameters which I won't explain, but um, we start to get into some uh, zones on the right-hand side, if you just go a little bit further, and we get all this crazy logic here, where we wanted to say, one, where, a div uh, where an object should be played from. For example, in this case, the object should be played from the near front, but also we wanted to have fallback solutions, because we know that people are going to connect their devices in, in an ad hoc manner. We want places to say, OK, well, if we don't have where it should be, let's play it where it could be. So we then define some could be's, and we also define some nevers, such that we have a, a way of saying, don't ever play it in that speaker if that's over there, because that doesn't make sense. Loads more metadata going on in the background, very complicated rule sets that um, we came up with. But that gives you a kind of a little bit of a taste of the, the structure of what's going on behind and the the way it's a, a big divergence from how we would normally uh, render audio. Okay, so that's uh, probably what I'm listening to. I've accidentally skipped a few backwards. <laughs> uh, I'm going to this thing is upside down. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we'll now move on to the slightly more interesting bit. That's the, the production in the background. Um, we're now going to move on to talk a little about the BBC Taster experience. There was a bunch of challenges involved in this, which won't go into a detail at all, but you can imagine we needed to recreate this in a way that was deliverable over the web. That, means, and that mean, meant entirely recoding um, in a web audio API sense. Uh, we needed to look at problems with connectivity, the levels of the different devices, whether we needed things like uh, compression, there's synchronization of the devices, usability experience. So can people understand how they're connecting to this? Do people understand what it is at all in the first place? So loads and loads of uh, challenges that we had to overcome. Um, and we we went about that through a series of prototyping. I should say probably this is more on the BBC R&D side of things, though myself and James were involved throughout. Um, there was a prototype system that was developed, um, a guy called Christian Henschel at BBC R&D was heavily involved in or did the majority of this. Um, but you could just tap in a pin code when a main session started and you could join it. And this was using our original object-based audio material from a few years ago, not designed for MDO, um, and sounds could pop out into your phone. Um, 
We then went about moving to try and do the Vostok K in this way. We had a kind of beta versions of it where we could um, adapt and, and see what was happening in, uh, without hiding stuff from the user in, in our kind of beta versions before we went to the, the, the final version, which you'll see shortly. Um, there was a whole bunch of user testing, so lots of kind of scripting, speaking to people, sitting them down, saying, um, so what would you do next? Um, does this make sense? And trying to understand from people how we could produce the limited, uh, the, the least number of kind of uh, complicated steps for them to go through and try and make it really intuitive how they would add devices to the experience. We would hope to make this a lot more automated in the future with adding devices, but we're not quite there yet. But we think it's uh, it's reasonable. Um, so yeah, more usability testing, uh, and then finally ending up with the public launch, which was about two weeks ago, and went uh, live on BBC Taster. Um, so, as I mentioned a couple of times, you can go and look at this, go play this at home right now. Um, but we're going to have an attempt at playing this in the room. Um, so, first thing. Um, are people on, I should have probably said this towards the start, are people connected on Wi-Fi? Have people got phones and all got Wi-Fi sorted? You can do this on your mobile data, it's just, it might cost you. Um, and it might be a little slower. Um, let's skip the connection trailer. Um, so this is just a little explainer about what we're going to do. Hopefully the experience kind of is relatively self-explanatory for people anyway. Um, but what we're actually going to do with the startup loop is myself and James are going to connect a couple of devices. Uh, because of the size of the room, we're going to connect a couple of devices and connect them to the, these little cubes just so we get a little bit more level so that people can hear far away. Um, but when you do um, connect, you'll be obviously make sure you're on the Wi Fi, go to this link. Just uh, note there's a double K on the end of this. A lot of people miss that off. Um, so bit.ly slash boss dot with a double K on the end will take you to the right page. And then um, make sure you've got your volume turned up, your media volume, that is, um, so that that's a good idea. Um, so yeah, make sure you've got your volume turned up so you can hear uh, what's happening. Um, just a quick note on this part. Um, we Most devices will take you automatically to the page on the next screen. So. Most devices will take you to a page, which I'll show you on the next screen, which has a pin code to enter. A couple of devices will think it, you're launching a, an experience yourself. Uh, that's just a little bug in the system. So what you need to do is just make sure you join as an additional speaker and not start your own version. Otherwise, we'll have many competing versions on the go, and then it will sound horrendous. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so what you should see, hopefully, when you go to this page, you should see a page like this. Um, when we start and connect to experience in, in a moment, there'll be a pin code that gets generated that we can put on the screen. Just tap that in there. <coughs> Tell it where you are in the room. In this case, we'll go for in the room um, rather than relative to you. Otherwise, everyone's just going to put it in front of them. Um, and then we won't get much. Uh, and then hopefully you should see a page that looks a bit like this. And you should have some form of audio coming out, perhaps some people more than others, because some people, when we add and add devices, you're going to end up with like kind of little sporadic bits of sound design rather than um, lots going on. But hopefully that should kind of give us a bit more of a, an experience spread throughout the room. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, it's pretty intuitive, I think. Um, and if you want, so James has um, just started up. Yeah, so should I pick up onto the yeah. HDMI? <clears throat> Yeah, so I've kind of start, started it up. We've already got um, two devices connected, which are this tablet and a phone. They may not end up in the same place now because they're going to be connected before the, uh, 
For decades, the Vostok K incident has so been I've actually got switches on the main characters here, so giving cues to people if they've got. Together. If you get the main character now, on your phone, half a century later, 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 NATO, and Soviet space program later, dossiers later, have been declassified, and audio recordings of the night in question have finally been recovered. The mysteries of the Vostok K incident are revealed. <laughs> She's a beauty, all right. Stormy as far as the eye can see. Over. Hello, Joe. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> what is it? Where'd you get it? You're not missing out, Joe. I promise. It's just the usual. No, it's yeah, the usual. You wouldn't need to go. If you want to just stick the. Yes, but not closely. Yeah, it's hardly Well, for you to be up to say, do you have any swine? Never mind all that. What's out there? Ah, clouds, Sam. Clouds and sea. Clouds are up and the sea is down. Probably we've got exit delay. It's going to be wet and windy from Cleethorpes to Clacton tomorrow, judging by that thing. Over. What about the channel I have? General, it's safe to assume I could get all of this. Why do we order that? It's all of this thing. For sake, Sam, stay on the line, won't you? I've got a fire, but I've done your armor for a bit. It's gone all serious here. What's that? It sounds a bit hush hush. Patch it up through now. Stay on this channel. Out. We can always send someone out. We anticipated you were seeing. Steady. We got the table. The valve shed on you was inches deep. You were confident we knew how you could assault. That's right, Lieutenant Joseph Finnegan. Over. Affirmative. Who am I talking to? Lieutenant, I need you to secure a heading. Turn onto course 85 and 840. Get her up to 520 knots. Over. On what authority? Over. Just do it, son, and await further instructions. Out. Do it. I know your real name. Let's see. Let's stick you up to court. I don't think there's a charge. Joe, that's clear. He is. Activity says Joe is a bit bossy. Roger. Wilco. Okay, so we'll just skip forward a little bit just She's so that really giving it what kicked for. in a bit about six minutes. So if we just skip forward to about then, what are the actors going on? Oh, I've been bloody shot at. He grew whiskers on his chin again. The wind came out the blue there again. Poor old Joseph Finnegan begin again. Because one are you reading? I'm under attack. It's not so bad. Just go again and again and again until it's over. Good at this sort of thing. Sam, there's someone out here trying to kill me. Oh, you're not afraid, I If you die tonight, so what? Something to tell the girls when you see them. I'm not joking, Sam. You're terrible with jokes, Joe. Just stick with what you know. Where are you? Someone's in your message here. Oh, I'm not. What is it? Sam, there's a jet out here and it nearly made Swiss cheese of me. She was told to do these things over and over. The same flight. Let's have another. Shall I get the axe back on the line? The rocket. Like it's gone backwards. Wait. Wait, there he is. I've got him, Sam. See how he likes the taste of his own medicine. It's a hawker, Sam. Hawker hunter. 
RAF markings. It's a, it's a bit of a kind of work in progress for us type, so some of you may have gone, got like falling, it's falling out sometimes from it. That might have been the Wi Fi, that might have been what we've done, we don't yet know. Um, but hopefully, you get a sense of what we've been doing. Do try it at home if you if you like to. Um, and also, we've got a kind of like you can see on the top right, there's a bit of a, a rating there. Um, so you can rate it if you like, but also quite importantly for us, there's a, a couple of questions, really quick questions afterwards, just simple things like, what did you most like? What did you least like? Um, that kind of thing. Mm. I think it takes you literally about it's like 20, three questions, I think, isn't it? 20, 30 seconds, you just click if you want. And then, but that's useful information for us because with our evaluation coming up, that will be yeah. a way that we can kind of understand whether people have actually uh, liked this. So yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming and listening. Any um, yeah, any questions? Any questions and thoughts? Yeah, how ready is it the tools for this to create? Which I know we've got arts and media, um, as well, and I'm just thinking of theatre. and for well, film, but theatre, this could be. So from um, the production side of things, very close to disseminating pretty much everything. Um, they're all S3A tools. Yeah, so everything's going to go up open source on the website yeah. at some point, probably in the next 12 months. So, so that would allow you to do what we showed you in the DAW version. Um, that then is not necessarily the same thing as having that on a browser. No, um, but you, you could run the DAW version with the same kind of uh, metadata. You specify where your speakers go, you specify your metadata for all your objects, create brand new content, and it will chuck all work. So you just then have a, that all come out in sound card. Um, what is uh, less clear at the moment, although I think pretty much everyone involved has the intention of disseminating it all, is the, uh, the browser tools. Um, that's got a little bit more work to kind of package it up in a way that's not just exclusively made for this particular content. Um, but there is definitely the will yeah. from our side um, and from many of the people at R&D who worked on this to put that out there as well. But that's kind of more easy legal loops. Yeah. So, you wanted to come over and have a, have a play around with this stuff, just give, yeah. just give us a shout and we... We have a 
system setup that you could just play around with now, uh, and the, the tools will be pretty much going live well, very soon. We'll yeah, I don't know when exactly, but it's going to be in the next like, six months. Yeah, oh, two months or something. Um, so, yeah, if you come and speak to us. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Uh, what happens if um, your phone has notifications? Is it just like you like them through? Anything? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your notification is coming through, that's not being blocked in any way. I mean, most phones you can set the, the volume to. Yeah, that's what I'm just trying to do. Yeah, so. I'm so I'm so so I, I have my phone on mute, but then turn the media volume oh, right, okay, off, so yeah. that's one way around it. Um, we don't pay attention to, well, we don't have ways of knowing that when there's an incoming phone call or anything like that. That's um, it's also the issue that you could have the main character in your phone then decide to leave. Yeah, to walk off oh, with yeah. the main dialogue <laughs> <laughs> still playing. This version at the moment, if you've tapped in that code on the far side of the country, you would have like taken one of those objects and taken it with right. That's the way it's coded at the moment. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's where we're at. But um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much where we are. You mentioned DAB. How does it sort out of the time delays? So that those were kind of just examples of uh, devices that are in the home uh, and could be addressable. So DAB, uh, well, I've got DAB that's got Bluetooth connection. Send over Bluetooth if you have that capability. This is all browser based at the moment, so we're talking basically phones, tablets, uh, phones, tablets, laptops, um, and anything that has a modern browser in it um, should should work for it. Uh, but yeah, there's there's plenty of bits of kit around your home that conceivably at some stage could be integrated into that. Do you think there'd be any way of finding out where devices are around such a big room? Because you're kind of alluding to that. Uh, well, um, where is he? Where's Matt? There he is. Uh, yes. We're, well, we've had someone, I've, I've done a little bit of looking into this. There's someone at BBC R&D who's got a bit of a beta demo version of this. But Magnus specifically is about to start doing a final year project on that very subject. So. How are you going to do it, Magnus? If we if we don't do we have to kill you. <laughs> now there are papers out there on doing this over kind of but yeah, on, on ad hoc arrays of it effectively relies on the fact that you've got a speaker and a microphone on the device. So you can imagine through some form of if you can estimate distances between things, you've got some form of approximate solution to how they might lie relative to each other. Do uh, particular objects get sent to particular devices, or do they get sent randomly to devices in the same region, and do they move around? Or? There's no moving um, in terms of, a, a, so at the moment, the, this, this could be made not static, but at the moment an object has entirely static um, advanced metadata. For, for the whole piece. So, so it'll go to a single device? Yes, so so that one object will, once once it's kind of locked in, will go to that one device and it will stay there. So it should have been, the, say, the, the sound character should land in a phone and then he should stay there. Yeah. Um, it's not to say we couldn't eventually have some dynamic metadata. So would that be what you put in your processes, say, uh, in that metadata? Uh, yes, yeah. But at the moment, we've got it in kind of this horrible engineer's spreadsheet type way. We'd like to make that kind of more intuitive. But uh, you can imagine sending it some some data with some time history that would allow you mm -hmm. to be able to update those that metadata with time. I think when you start thinking about moving objects, so then you start getting into issues, I guess, with latency between between yeah. devices. So I some mean, more so you have like six devices, you know, in this region. Yeah. So it would kind of just jot around between them kind of every time the every every the time so mm. so say so say an object like that it, there's like these should be could be type mm. things going on should be could be never and say it found that it has um it could find that it's got two or three should be depending on what you define for it in which case it has to roll a dice okay yeah. um and then it lands in one and then it sticks there um it might find none of those and go to a could be but then if you ran the whole experience again, it would then say, oh, those, those three should be, I'll roll the dice again, and it might then jump into a different yeah. 
in the same kind of area because it would still jump into one of the speakers that it, it ideally should go into. So that's the way it works. It will kind of randomize. You go to multiple. Pardon? You go to multiple. So, so there's uh, mo most of the content doesn't, but there is uh, one part of it where there's um, you have this kind of spread or diffuseness uh, element where you can route to many. So uh, what that effectively does when you when you spread an object is I think it decorrelates them slightly, um, and then it it will route to all of the um, devices that are in its best zone. So if it finds three should be's, it'll spread around those should be's. If, it find, if it's got no should be's and it finds two could be's, it'll spread around those two could be's. But that's the way it works at the moment. Um, so yeah, we do have a way of kind of creating, I think like it's been used on things like Thunder and things like that, where that kind of spreads mm -hmm. around the room. That was one of the main things the sound designer asked for after because we yeah. did kind of two iterations of the production and yeah she really wanted to be able to take one object and send it to yeah. some multiple devices at the same we, time. We were doubling and quadrupling objects just so that we had versions of them available to distribute around the place but then we ended up using this more um, spread version one object to many. So the in terms of the actual implementation, not not the um, not the actual hardware latency, because that's a bit harder to compensate for. Yeah. Um, but the actual network and uh, connection uh, latency is on the order of within ten to twenty milliseconds, okay. which is not something that you could then use for say pan or probably really tightly controlled music or something like that, but um, it, it's sufficient to be able to have a narrative that completely makes sense yeah. against dialogue. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've got a set of sources or like you say some uncorrelated distributed source, then yeah. it's all good. Yeah. I think it's a thing, as long as it's not really timing critical, so we found that one of the, the more challenging pieces of content that we tried yeah. and it really kind of break, like we had this really tight pop track in an object based form, you try to do it over something that has some latency and it just sounds like a yeah, really sloppy band play. <laughs> so it just completely ruins it. But um, yeah. But yeah, but things like if you have to send dialogue and spot effects and yeah, like the correlated stuff out then 10, 20 milliseconds doesn't doesn't matter really. I have that problem with insurmountable, isn't it? Really? It's just dependent on yeah. mm. it sounds on versus example. Mm. That's mm. a very, very big prioritized process isn't it? That will be a very big kind of to overcome. Um, but yeah, that, that's the kind of the kind of latency that we're working with, which is pretty good. You kind of almost get some, well, you do get some level of decorrelation between devices anyway, because people show up with all these various different phones. They've got crazily different responses to them. They're in different parts of the room. So I think you get some kind of natural decorrelation between things anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question about workflows. I know it's something that got discussed at and yeah. the TNS talk just been as well, and I thought as well. So for LOE, for example, like how much longer would it take to do something like this? I, just, I mean, know it's kind of brand new right now, but yeah. just do it. No, no, yeah, we, we, we know the figures. <laughs> <laughs> that is an order of magnitude. Yeah, 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 an order of magnitude greater currently. Um, so I think she said for this content, normally stereo would take mm -hmm. her around about a full day. Yeah, I think so, and it took like. Two uh, weeks or two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, that said, the first week was largely um, us kind of learning um, how to set the system up. Mm -hmm. um, Eloise was going back and playing around a little bit with the stereo mix itself, mainly because of the fact that we had this extra narrative. Mm -hmm. So we had the, um, the Tatiana and the General, which is the interview looking back on the event um, that was coming out one of the cubes. So that's not always there, but when that's not there, there's, you kind of have silence, uh, not the silence, but you have long periods of not much happening, apart from some other little bits of sound design, which then do notice that and then come in to fill the gap, but it kind of drags a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got that going on. Um, but yeah, so th there was about a week where we were just learning how to set it up and and 
try and explain the concept, which if we did this again, that way wouldn't happen. So probably a factor of about five to one, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, which is a lot, but, <laughs> but again, the tools are not intuitive. They're not, um, and the, 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 the sound designer is constantly having to think about what type of metadata to attach to. It's not, it's not instinctive. So once that person learned those rules, it would it would come down further, but it's still going to be a lot more than it is going. It'd be quite interesting to compare how long it took Eloise. I know Eloise a little bit um, to, to someone who who's used to doing sound design for gaming. Yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. Kind of process. I'd be interested to see if they, you know what I mean, just to see if it's compared to my interest. Mm. Someone who works in an object-based world, anyway. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, I think that's come up a few times when we've said what would this be used, uh, what would you see this being used for and a few people have said game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, people waiting to get into the room. Oh. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think okay. we maybe. Uh, Thanks guys for the <laughs>